So we're out at Belinda's property today, a small horse property, to show an example of how the general principles of regenerative agriculture can apply across all scales and all different types of properties. I've been a horse lover all my life and I grew up on a beef cattle property when I was younger. So I ended up um, doing a degree in ag science out of, straight out of uni. I ended up moving to a small country town where the farrier there stopped coming and I had all my mates and friends go, hey, can you trim my horses as well? Kind of worked out that it fit in really well around young kids and family in a town that didn't have a lot of childcare. So I moved into that area. Whilst I was doing my training in that area, I realised so much of um, our pastures and feed type things that we give to our horses has all been based around that cattle and sheep framework of putting on kilos of meat or wool or litres of milk. And our horses need the exact opposite. So from a health perspective, our pastures, you know, that has a huge impact on horse health. And, you know, I had a background in animal nutrition and whatever. So I started just kind of putting the two things together as a barefoot trimmer and getting on a lot of small horse properties, you know, that five to 10 acres, finding out just how much a lot of horse people had come probably from a city background, didn't have an understanding of pastures or grazing management. And um, one of the things that I've always found with horse owners is that they've come into horses looking at from a horse management perspective and they've never really considered the pasture management side of that. It was just a, you know, a paddock is a place to put their horse in and potentially you get a bit of grazing during winter. They, they needed help and there wasn't a lot of um, people that worked in that space to, to help them out. we have this tendency to keep one horse in one paddock and another horse in another paddock and then you know stable them overnight to keep them off the grass or put them in small yards and none of that is either good for the paddocks or the environment or the horses you know there's all the health um, issues that come with that be it laminitis weight issues colic that kind of thing so in the meantime you know actually set up my own place and and try and set it up as best I could to be kind of a demonstration property for other people and then allowing people to see those systems in place and then be able to kind of go from there to developing how they might implement that on their own property. I think I hope that when people can see demonstrations of really responsible, sustainable land management on horse properties that they can get a really solid understanding of how they can implement that themselves, these biodiversity refuges that we can see here can coexist with horses that have freedom of movement and have access to these really healthy pastures. On this property I've set it up as a track system because I need to manage the amount of time the horses are actually on the paddock. So this is our essentially our sacrifice area and it works really well because from a shire perspective we need to have bare fire breaks over summer. This way the horses keep it bare pretty much 90% of the year anyway other than this time of year when it's wet um, and that allows us to give the horses that freedom of movement and uh, be able to protect our paddocks from overgrazing. You know, if you keep them on the grass 24 seven or set stocked on the paddock, they're going to trash the paddock eventually, like it will end up as bare ground. From the outset, it's pretty obvious that it's being managed really responsibly. You can see that we've got ground cover all through the property and that last year round because of how it's managed, we've got perennials in the system and we've got annuals and the way that the horses move around the property through that track system and it's divided into two paddocks at the moment but it can be split up into smaller paddocks so there's that impact for short periods of time and then long rest and recovery periods so that ground cover can be maintained and there's still living roots in the system year round. If the paddocks get overgrazed obviously there's damage, potential for erosion, it works really well in, in these small landholder systems because when our feed runs out, generally here it can run out any time, depending on the season, between November and January. Then between January and the break of the season, you can run the horses on that area 
It keeps it bare for the shire requirements and it also allows us to protect and maintain 100% ground cover on our paddocks um, all throughout the year. Just a single water trough close to the house and then we try and put the hay as far away to generate that movement, which is, you know, a horse health fitness type thing. The other thing we've done is fence off the creek line through here and revegetate that. So we've got added biodiversity that's protected from the horses and that becomes a refuge for wildlife. There's been, yeah, some management interventions through that creek line so that the soil health has been able to build up by holding more water. Didn't have a lot of protection mm -hmm. and it was kind of fairly deeply scoured out. Um, so we kind of put in a series of leaky weirs to kind of hold the water up, send it sideways into the, the soil profile so we could grow more grass and use a lot of deep rooted perennials to kind of keep the green there year round. And for the most part, close to the creek line, we will have year round green feed. So that's, that's pretty cool. Over time, we've had birds and bandicoots and turtles and all of that kind of stuff move in, which is great. And we try and kind of keep that as protected as possible. Things I think Nicole Masters talks about is that for every 1% increase in soil carbon, you've got an increase in water holding capacity in your soil of like 144,000 yeah. litres per, per hectare, right? And if it's not being caught and stored in the soil, it's going down our yeah. creeks and our waterways and creating flooding. And, and I would rather have it in my soil feeding my plants and have some really nice, good, deep rooted perennials that can access it most of the year round. And probably from a fire safety perspective too, you know, the more green feed yeah. you have, the longer the season. So I aim to have um, diversity in my pastures. So I want a mix of annuals and perennials. I want a mix of grasses, legumes, and some other um, herbs or forbs. So things like uh, chicory, narrow leaf plantain, we've got um, coxfoot, annual rye grasses, and then you're going to get your other things like your odd little weeds and things through there that will add other other bits into the system. And, it, and then just graze it carefully because obviously horses are pretty picky. They like what they like and they'll eat that out. So trying to manage grazing so that we get species survival over the years is, is actually pretty important. So. And even like the way that the weeds are viewed on this property, you know, they're serving a purpose. This area also like we tend to ride in this particular bit because it's shaded both summer and winter. It, any area that kind of gets compacted, things that have a little bulb or a um, taproot or something like that, they're going to take over a little bit. Yeah. So you've, I just accept that mm. that's doing its job trying to break up compaction and so I, I leave it be so that if it does its job, the grasses will come back through yeah. when they're ready. And, you know, I would say it probably also likes mopping up the um, phosphorus and potassium out of the manure that mm. sometimes comes through. So it's doing a job, right? And so I don't, don't get worried. I'll come through and um, slash it when it gets kind of big and starts to flower, just so it's not dominating. But it, it's doing a job and it's serving a purpose. So I, I don't get generally too concerned about weeds. And I know that if I manage the rest of my pasture for ground cover and make sure that the soil's healthy, none of the weeds will, will pro proliferate or become dominant. Across the state, there's about 60,000 small landholders, which covers an area of about 650,000 hectares. When you consider those numbers, that's a lot of land these landholders are responsible for. And I think there's a bit of disparity when it comes to the resources that are available to those landholders and the education that's out there. So you can kind of start just doing small things on your property with the resources that you have available to you. It's quite heartening to see that the horses respond so positively to that environment and then you get all of these additional bonuses. Yeah, I think seeing all that come together in the context of horse ownership is, yeah, pretty inspiring. You know, people came into horse management or property management more from the horse management side than the pasture management side. So when I initially saw there was a bit of a hole there, I started running some training courses so that um, 
people could learn a bit more about how they could do it themselves. And then over time, if you went and then visited them later, especially if they were clients where I was also doing their horse's feet and whatnot, you knew you were on a winner when they became ultimately more precious about their grass than they were about their horses. And there you were kind of like, yeah, we've, we've, we've changed the way that they think about their grass and their management and, and how they operate their property. And that's, that's a, a win.